Hey everybody, what's up? It's Chase. Welcome to another episode of the Chase Jarvis Live Show here on Creative Live. You know the show where I sit down with incredible humans. This week's incredible human is the one and only Mr. Robert Greene, the number one New York Times bestseller of so many books, including The Laws of Human Nature, Mastery, The 48 Laws of Power, The Art of Seduction, and more. We also talk about his new book today called The Daily Laws, which as a longtime fan of Robert's work, this is what I believe the an amazing amalgam of all his work, uh, strategies for day-to-day -day transformation of your life, about being honest, about living in integrity, pursuing your dreams in a world where things like power and uh, attraction, uh, the art of seduction. These are true forces at work. Robert's work is uh, indelible on our culture and it's going to make a mark on you today. So I'm going to get out of the way and let you enjoy this conversation between yours truly and Robert Green. Dear friend, Robert Green, welcome back to the show. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me on, Chase. It's been, this is the third time, and each time is very memorable, for me at least. Uh, and I, every time we get together, whether it's to record a podcast or uh, for me just to be inspired by your work, it's always awesome. Uh, I know you're coming, from, coming at us today from Los Angeles, from your home there. I wish we were in person. But alas, we are still uh, still a, a thousand miles or so apart. Um, but I feel like I am prepared to ask you a number of questions about your latest work. Uh, and for those who uh, haven't seen our, uh, hopefully most people are familiar with our previous interviews. Uh, this will build on those because I've done a bit of research on what we've talked about in the past. And I want to go to some new ground. Uh, I also definitely want to cover uh, The Daily Laws, which is your latest book. Uh, and I understand that this is your first conversation about your new work that will it be is. out in public. It Great. is. We're going to get the we're going to get the raw, unpolished. Uh, it's like you haven't done the Conan, Tim yeah. Ferriss, Brene no, Brown no, tour no. yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to get all the bugs uh, out on this interview. Well, you have written, I want the bugs. Let's, let's, let's get, let's draw them out. So you have a career that spent, spans decades, um, written about, uh, wisdom, about power, um, about struggle, uh, so many things. And this most recent book, uh, has taken a new shape. And I always like to start off with, um, an artist's work through the lens of an actual piece, which is one of the reasons I wanted to start with the book. And so many things, if if form follows function, this book, The Daily Laws, is around meditations on power, seduction, mastery, strategy, and human nature on a day-to-day -day level. Why this new format? What's behind it, and how did you arrive that, that this is the right way to get the message out about daily behaviors, thoughts, actions? Well, I have to thank Ryan Holiday. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with Ryan, good friend oh, yes. of mine. He's here a couple good days friend of ago. our mutual friend, yes. And um, Ryan has that book, Daily Stoic, right? Mm -hmm. Which you're probably familiar with. They're hugely successful, a wonderful book. And he, he and I were talking, he said, Robert, you should really do something similar with your own work. And basically he said, the idea is, I've got all these kind of bits of wisdom, if you want to put it that way, scattered through the six books, and they each cover kind of different subjects. And a lot of people don't really know where to start, which book to start with. And they also find it a little bit confusing because, you know, mastery is about your career. 48 Laws is about dealing with difficult political situations and their seduction. And so we, uh, the idea was to kind of pull it all together, to take passages from the book, but to make it very mindful, not just to have, you know, any old daily laws book with, with like kind of a day by day practice, but to give it an order, a structure, to be creative with it and to sort of create a flow through the year that would take you 
take your mind inside what I'm trying to inculcate you with. And so we created the structure. You know, I talked with Ryan and I worked with him and basically this is what I came up with. We kind of start out by looking at you and your career and mastery the first three months. And each day is kind of a meditation on you, on where you're going, on your apprenticeship phase, on the kind of careers you choose and what it takes to become creative in life, because that's sort of the ultimate power that you can possess in any kind of career. Then the next three months sort of take you through the world of power, of difficult, manipulative people, of the, of the kind of things that blindside you, the political nature of the human animal, and sort of instructing you on how to control yourself, how to not get enmeshed in people's kind of ugly games, and to be able to have a level of detachment when people try to suck you into their, their stupid dramas. The next three months are kind of like the seduction, the soft side of power, persuasion and influence, which is something I think people are actually quite bad at, unfortunately. I'm not you know, saying that I'm superior. It's been a long, hard... I've been writing about this for 25 years, but I think we've all become a little bit more self-absorbed with all the technology in our lives and the ability to get inside other people's heads and to know what will move them is kind of a lost art. So this is three months is going to sort of immerse you in that. And the final three months are about human nature, about kind of getting into human psychology and understanding on a very deep level what motivates human behavior. And in the very last month, I also include passages from the book that I'm currently working on, The Law of the Sublime, and we can perhaps discuss that later. But the gist of it is, is that I believe, after all of my years of work, that what people want, what is the, what gives you power in life, is not necessarily particular forms of knowledge, but it's your attitude, how you look at the world, how you look at people, right? It's something I've been trying to bang into people's heads through my six books. I want to change how you look at the world from the inside out. I want you to forge this kind of realistic attitude. And by reading these passages day after day, each day kind of meditating on them and thinking about them in the course of your life and how it might relate to you and your experiences, this realistic attitude is going to slowly sink into you and it's going to have some meaning. It's going to be able to translate into actions, practical actions in your life. And then you'll reread it a second year and a third year and however long you want to. And I think it's the kind of... It'll, it'll sink inside and it will change how you look at the world. It's a brilliant organizational structure. Just despite being known as a quote creative, I find that I am a structured thinker. And before I start on a process, I want to be able to zoom out and see how some of these pieces fit together. So the organization that you just outlined um, is spectacular for someone like me who really craves the structure, but the day-to-day -day part, I, I want to understand at, you say this, uh, numerous times in the book and in your other work, you have a book talk that talks about human nature and the laws of human nature, which we discussed on the show previously at our foundation, we are social animals, right? right. We are yeah. animals. And how has your work embraced this is it you know i guess i'll i'll make an analogy business books so often say well if you're going to start a business you start it like this and then you do this and this and this and then you end up with this you know a great outcome or it just it's very um linear and simplistic and it seems like you've tackled the largest possible problem when you acknowledge that we are both animals and complex social creatures. What on what on earth made you tackle <laughs> the you know human nature? Like these are these are huge huge um, concepts. Why why did you start there? Well, you know, I find a lot of books that are written out now, and, and kind of the advice that people get is very sort of simplistic. It doesn't really get at the root of what's going on. And I'm somebody that really, truly wants to understand the reality of situations. I'm not satisfied with kind of surfacy sort of perspectives on people, on business, 
on strategy, on creativity. I want to get underneath. I want to really get at the root of what's going on, right? And so as you say, as you wisely say, people are incredibly complicated. They're very complex. And we're not used to that. We're, we're trained to think almost in this very linear, almost algorithmical fashion where A leads to B. I absorb all this information, this data that I get, and then solutions will come to me. And that's not how people operate. I mean, if you look at yourself and you look at the actual complexity of one single emotion that you might feel, if you actually um, analyze in the course of a day that feeling of excitement that you have, perhaps by something that triggers it, you'll find if you go deeper into yourself and you're able to, because not everyone can, you find below the surface four or five things, other emotions, other things going on at the same time, perhaps things from your childhood, things that are unconscious. You're not even aware of what's truly motivating your behavior. You're kind of sleepwalking. You think that you do things for reason A, but actually there's B, C, D, E, and F below the surface. So you're a mystery to yourself. And so, you know, if you walk around a, room, a dark room blindly, you're going to trip over things. And that's what happens to people. They make mistakes. They misunderstand. They take wrong paths in their career. They get in relationships that are completely bad for them, etc. So I want you to help you get underneath the surface. I want you to dive down below what we think of as being the actual, what's really happening. I want you to dive below and see what's really, really going on. And to do that, it requires a lot of effort. It requires a degree of humility, which is something that a lot of people are missing today. I'm not trying to preach or feel superior because I have all the problems that I mentioned. But the idea that I don't know who I am. I don't know why Chase is behaving this particular way in the office. I don't really understand you, or what motivates your behavior. And from a position of ignorance and humility, I can begin to you know, make some, some progress in figuring out what's really going on underneath the surface. Because people wear masks. They pretend to love your ideas. They pretend to think everything you do is wonderful. We're all so politically correct in this world, so tight, we can't really express ourselves. And so you can get lost. It's very tricky environments that we're, that we're going through. And I want to really, really help people understand what's going on below the surface, because that's where interesting things are happening. Is it fair to say that you can write from experience? You just ad admitted, I think, vulnerably so and accurately so that we're all this hodgepodge there's it strikes me that you do such a good example or sorry you do such a good job of using very prescient examples in your book i mean i i go back to many uh in the laws of nature that it's it's interesting to hear you in this moment say look i am saddled with all of the same stuff so how 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 have you been able to extract yourself long enough to either just be aware of it and then to, more importantly, from a process perspective, to write about it? Well, um, you know, I, I, I tend to be sort of honest with myself. I'm always a little bit too hard on myself, which is another kind of fault, flaw that I have. And I'm very self-critical. So, um, you know, before I wrote The 48 Laws of Power, I had been somebody who who spent many years kind of wandering and lost in life. And I made many, many mistakes, political mistakes in the office. I had some of the worst jobs you can imagine with some of the worst bosses that exist in this world. I've had 60 different jobs in all sorts of areas. I've seen it all. And many of the problems arose from myself, from my own behavior. And as a writer, I'm very interested in analyzing characters and people, but I also apply it to myself. And so when it came to write the fourth time to write the 48 Laws of Power, and I was reflecting on my time in Hollywood, I could look back on a lot of my own mistakes. You know, so law number one, never outshine the master. Very important law. It's law number one because everybody, almost everybody in the planet has committed, has violated this law. I had violated it. 
I think two, maybe three times in my life, and it had very severe consequences. So I was, I had to be honest with myself. I don't talk about that in the 48 laws, but I can, I know the experience. I know the pain it causes because you, when you violate the, the never outshine the master, nobody ever tells you why you're being fired or why, what's really happening. And it's very painful. You come away confused. You're fired because you tried too hard because you showed yourself to be too good. How weird, how awful, right? It's very confusing. I understand that confusion because I went through it. So I'm a very flawed individual and I talk and I'm very open about it, right? I have many of the, in the laws of human nature, I make the point of each of these elements that I'm talking about, each chapter reveals a particular flaw in the way in our construction. You know, our brains were wired 200,000 years ago for living in the savannas of East Africa, not for living in Midtown Manhattan or Seattle or wherever you happen to find yourself. And so we have, a, we, we have some de very definite defects in our character that we need to work on. And I have every single one of them. So I write a chapter on narcissism, right? And I'm trying to tell you, the reader, you think everybody else out there is a narcissist? It's Donald Trump. It's this person. It's that person. No, you are a narcissist. It's every human being has these tendencies. And as I'm writing the chapter, I'm saying to my girlfriend, damn it, you know, I'm just realizing I am a pretty narcissistic person. <laughs> you know, I never really thought of it that way. And it was kind of painful. But it was also sort of enlightening because now I'm much more aware. I catch myself in these moments where I find myself being narcissistic. But the idea is that your self-awareness, your honesty with yourself is a very important quality that you need to have. Because if you go around thinking everybody else has a problem, you're never gonna work on yourself and you're gonna be tripping over yourself. You're gonna be misreading people. You're gonna be making all kinds of mistakes. So it all begins with the ability to reflect on who you are and to be honest with yourself. That's what occurs to me as I hear you describe this. There's a sort of like a truth dart. I'm wondering if, is there a tro is, is, are you, is there some Trojan horse in, you know, active in your work? Is there a, you know, is it, or do you try and put everything on the surface? Everything just out there, not surface. That's that sounds a little bit thin. I mean, I mean, it's just like, are you trying to say everything, or is there some ongoing active uh, Trojan horse in your work? And I'm I, this is not a leading class question. No is a fine answer. I'm just curious. It seems to me that there's something that your work is always pregnant with, and maybe it's the truth. I don't know. I think it's the truth, and I think it's it's reality. Um, I, I've always been kind of bothered by the fact that, that there's so much bullshit in the world and that people aren't really honest about what's going on, you know, and that's what I wrote the book about power is people want power. They love the feeling of it, but they never want to talk about it. They never want to admit it. So that lack of honesty is something that just gets under my skin and really annoys me, right? So I begin each book the kind of a level of irritation and frustration and a little bit of anger, because I like writing from a position of anger. It kind of gives my books a little bit of oomph, a little bit of energy that I think the reader picks up. And I could go through each book and kind of discuss the, the little bit of anger that kind of generated it. But the laws of human nature was that people pretend to be something that they're not, right? They pretend yeah. that they're not aggressive, that they're so virtuous, so pious. And look at all what we're going through now with all the virtue signaling and the social justice warriors. You know, we all have to pretend to be so pious, et cetera. And it's just bullshit. We're not like, it's not who we are. You know, everybody is flawed. We all have feelings of envy. And so I think, it, I think to answer your question, the Trojan horse is people's hypocrisy and lack of honesty about themselves really kind of pisses me off and it kind of drives the desire to write each book. Mastery might be a little bit different, but then again, there was also an element of anger there too as well, where people aren't honest about what it really 
you know, was really required to become creative and become a master in your field. There are all kinds of illusions about you're born a genius, you're born privileged, you went to the right school, you got the right education, all nonsense. It all starts from within and your attitude and your level of persistence and determination. So I think to answer your question, it's the, it's the kind of bullshit that pervades our culture that kind of motivates each one of my books. Uh, yeah, that's, it just, it's so, the truth has a sound, a truth, you know, you can, it just, it, you can, it just has a sound, um, in researching for our conversation and reading, you know, various different excerpts and marketing speak, I heard, uh, speaking of the 48 laws of power, which does manifest itself quite prominently in your new book in, you know, the, the daily laws and the, there was a word ruthless and another word pragmatic that were together in a sentence. Is that, yeah, is that, but to me, that's what we need. This is this is why I've always been attracted to your work. And it is that intentional? Are you? Is it just you? Just is that what the truth sounds like? Does it? Does the truth sound ruthless but pragmatic? I mean, pragmatic, right? Very practical. There's utility. There's is that? Is well, that's that a, it's a great question. Like? It's kind of a blend of two different things, which is sort of my style, if, if, you, if I could go there, which is ruthless. Ruthless is kind of an emotional thing. And ruthless by itself could be rather bad. I mean, you could mm-hmm. signal a lack of control. You're just pushing people around. You're getting your way. You're pissing everybody off. You're just going to get power by any means necessary. And then you hit a wall because so many people dislike you. And you see that a lot in politics or entertainment where people like Harvey Weinstein or whomever, they're so aggressive. They're so manipulative. They're so ruthless that they make one wrong step and everybody piles on them because everybody hates them, right? So ruthless by itself is an emotional quality that will get you in trouble. Being pragmatic by itself, if there's no energy behind it, if you're just a pragmatic person who, you know, goes to the market and gets good organic food and is kind of, you know, takes care of yourself, it doesn't lead to anything great, right? It doesn't have any kind of wider scope. It's just being practical. And a lot of very practical people don't get very far in life, right? Because they're too conservative. But you put the two together and you have an energy. It's kind of like the metaphor that I talk a lot about of the rider and the horse. The horse is that animal, the ruthless part, that animal that will take you anywhere. But if you don't control the animal, it'll take you over the edge of a cliff if you're not careful. But But you, the rider, you're rational, you're practical, you're pragmatic. You control the horse. Without the horse, you won't go anywhere because you don't have enough energy. But putting those two together... The emotion, the raw human emotion, the animal part with the more human, rational, pragmatic part, something beautiful will happen. I'm a very pragmatic person. I like getting results. I think there are too many dreamers in this world. I like dreaming. I I was a dreamer for so many years when I was younger, and I have nothing against it because without dreaming, you'll never have great ideas. But there are too many people who think that they're brilliant and they don't know how to actually get things done. They don't know how to write that book. They don't know how to start that business. They don't know how to really win an election, right? And so they kind of fumble around and nothing ever coheres, nothing ever turns into anything solid, right? So I like practical. I want, if you have a great idea, you have to execute it. And that ain't easy in this world. You need to have energy, you need to have determination, you need to be motivated. So the blend of those two qualities, I think you very, I've never thought of it this way before, Chase, but it's a very wise question that putting those two things together is kind of the essence of, of what I preach if I am preaching. Oh, preach, please keep preaching. <laughs> we, we need it. Uh, and I think that's part of the reason you've sold millions and millions. I don't know how many millions now copies of your books. Uh, this brings me to something that you it start, you know, it's you get to it early in, um, in the daily laws, and it's attitude. That is a thing. There's so many things in the world that we cannot control, right? Uh, 
the list is, is infinite things we can't control. It's cliche to say that we can control our attitude. And yet there is this, you know, speaking of what the truth sounds like when everyone hears this quality of having a, I would say a, a, a good or a great attitude rather than just positive, because that would be, I think, you know, antithetical to what you stand for in the conversation we just had is <laughs> case in point. But so how do you reconcile these different things? Like, how do you reconcile attitude and approaching the day with vigor and, and all this stuff and not, you know, coating it all in bullshit? What, help me understand in, you know, in Robert's brain, how are these two things, how do they coincide? Well, the first thing is, if we're talking about brutal honesty, which would be another combination of two words here, that's what you need to alter your attitude. It's not easy. It's not waking up and being all sugary and sentimental. I'm going to be so nice. I'm going to have a wonderful, pleasant, positive attitude. Everything is wonderful in life. That won't work. And it's not real. So we want, we want to hit something real. So I meditate every single morning, right? As I mentioned, or I've been doing this for 11 years, as I mentioned earlier, I have flaws. I have things that I've been working on for years, okay? And one thing that I had, it's been striking me the last few days that I've been meditating on, is the fact that I can't let go of certain emotions, certain things that irritate me. They just go around in my head, and I hate that. I want to be free of them, right? And so I developed this idea in my meditation. I'm going to repeat the word over and over again. Let go, let go, let go, Robert, let go. A thought comes up, let go of it. A, a bad feeling comes up, let go of it, right? And then I try to say, all right, now I'm going to use that in the course of the day. And it ain't working because they still keep popping up. But now I see them popping up and now I'm able to work on them. It's just like, punching little tiny holes in a solid piece of concrete. And in the beginning, they're just little tiny holes and you're not getting anywhere. You keep at it month after month and it'll start turning into a sculpture. Something will happen from it. So you have to begin with an awareness. You have to begin understanding your negative patterns. They're very real. They're very powerful. We are creatures of habit. That's what happens. That's how our brain functions. Like certain neural networks are formed as we do something over and over again, and we can't break out of them. And so just simply saying, I'm going to alter my attitude, it means nothing. Nothing will happen. You have to be aware of the negative patterns that tend to dominate your life. You need to be brutally honest. And in the course of the day, you need to see them kind of popping up. And you go, no, I don't want that. I want to try something else, right? And then you have to have some positive reinforcement. You have to have some wonderful emotions as well. It can't all be negative. It can't all be, God damn it, I'm a piece of shit. I keep thinking this. There also has to be some positive reinforcement, right? So in the course of the day, I let go of that irritating voice that's saying, why didn't that person return my email? I'm going, wow, this is a great feeling. If I could repeat this feeling for 24 hours, I would be an enlightened, I would be Buddha. I would be so happy. I'd be able to let go of everything, right? And so I get some positive feedback from that. So you need a combination of the two, but you have to be, you have to be very honest with yourself. And crafting the right kind of attitude in which you accept everything in life, you accept even your own flaws to a degree, is very, very powerful. It's the main, most powerful thing I talked about earlier, like a realistic attitude, an accepting attitude. But you have to understand it's not going to come tomorrow. There are no self-help books that are going to turn you around in 24 hours. There's not a podcast in the universe that will change you overnight. It's going to take work day in and day out, but you will see the benefits as I see them with my letting go mantra. Well. Speaking of over and over and the concept behind the book of the daily laws, that's, you know, there's this, that's pretty much the only vector on which we can cultivate change. We can cultivate transformation. As you said, it doesn't happen in an instant. There might be a tipping point, but it, I think uh, Tolstoy, right? There's a Tolstoy quote about 
uh, daily study. Um, it's necessary for all people. And if you know, we walk around speaking of the bullshit meter, talking about you know human potential and transformation, but all that without without work, is that again in part by this a new format for you? Is that part of the the is that why you've packaged your work in this new new way? I mean, I know we talked about Ryan, but is it because this is a key vehicle through which transformation is actually possible? Well, yes. I mean, um, you know, to write a book, it takes, for me at least, because my books are kind of difficult with all the research, it takes a lot of patience. It takes day by day by day practice. And then you break through. You don't know how hard I work on a book. It's, I, I can't even reveal it to you. But I, the problem I see in, a lot in the world today, I don't want to sound like some cranky old Bernie Sanders here, but there's a problem that I see in the world. I guess I can't avoid it. Maybe I am a <laughs> cranky older Jewish person. I don't know. But anyway, is that we live in this entertainment industry where we've all been imbued with this idea that great things happen to us through these kind of grand dramatic gestures. I travel to Bali. I take ayahuasca. I go and join this particular cult. I start some rigorous yoga practice and I'll be changed. That's not how it occurs. I'm sorry. It's not like in the movies where a superhero emerges and, you know, they've got this shield and they end up destroying the enemy. That's not how change or action actually occurs. It's a process. It's boring. It's banal. It's day by day by day by day. The small things matter. The habits matter. Like I'm saying, that voice in my head, in the course of a day, 50 times it'll pop up. Why didn't that person call me back? Why are they avoiding me? Why didn't they like my book? Blah, blah, blah. And I have to by, I have to develop the habit of letting it go, letting it go, letting it go. And then by the third, fourth day and several weeks, it starts to become something regular, a habit. The power of doing things every day is unbelievable. You know, if you just persist at it, if you just have patience, if you just have a practice where instead of reaching for the grand gesture and traveling halfway across the world for change, you just stay where you are, you stay in your home and you work on yourself and you develop daily habits. I mean, it's, it's, I, I don't know how much more, what more I can say. I, I'm sounding like I, a street corner preacher. <laughs> <laughs> well. I think this, you know, I, I'm a huge believer in habits and I try to break my, you know, my, my list of, if I have a goal, I try and reverse engineer, you know, this, you know, goals are at the tip of, of the pyramid, you know, habits and, you know, that kind of stuff is in the middle of the pyramid and mindset is at the bottom because without the, to use your word, awareness, um, and the desire to change the mindset that's built for it, change is not going to happen. So I want to go, I want to scratch one, one, uh, bit deeper on, you know, this idea of attitude in your work and specifically in the daily laws, what's the most common, um, in, you know, in your research, because your, your work is so highly researched. What would you say is the most common um, attitude that needs adjustment? Well, um, it's sort of what I've discussed already. It's the fact that you're able to look at yourself honestly, because you're walking around with what I call a self-opinion. That's the word I use in the laws of human nature. You have an opinion about yourself, right? You think that you're, most people think that they're basically good, that they're kind, that people like them, that they're a team player. Most people think that they're rational, that they make decisions based on thinking rather than emotions, you know, on and on and on down the list. And more chance, more, more likely than not, 
your self-opinion is elevated above the reality. Now, some people it's below, and they're people who beat themselves up, and that's another form. It's the opposite, but it's actually the same problem. It's not being realistic. It's not who you are. You're not up here, and you're not a worm either. You're here in the middle. This is who you are, a fully complete, rounded human being. Okay, so the right attitude, the core of it is the ability to understand yourself and to look at yourself honestly, and to admit that you have these particular flaws. Because your attitude is riddled with probably um, some defects, right? Right? You you tend to, yeah, every time sure. something course, wrong yeah. happens, you blame other people instead of looking at yourself, right? Things like that. You get down on the world when actually it's coming from within. So you need to be able to see yourself and see yourself as the source of the problem. You know, I go in the, in that chapter in the Daily Laws and the Laws of Human Nature, and I explain on and on how, let's say you're in an interaction as a, as a professor with a student or a boss with an employee. And if you, the boss or the teacher, has thinks of that other person as being worthy, as, as worthy of respect, as dignified, is, is, you know, a human being like you are, and you should treat them as such, and you appreciate them, they feel it. They feel it without words being expressed because we're nonverbal creatures, right? So your attitude, how you look at people, how you view them, how you view events, alters what happens to you, right? So if you look at that person and you think, God, they're just so stupid, I can't stand them, they pick it up. And then they react against you and nothing interesting can happen. Any kind of connection or electrical charge between you is cut off right then. But if you look at them and you go, no, that's not right. They're actually, they're actually really interesting in some way. Then the circuit opens and something can happen. But it starts in your head. It's not something that starts in the world. It starts inside of you. You have to be able to look at yourself and say, I approach people already with a scornful attitude. And it creates these reverberating consequences. So the right attitude can only come through self-reflection and self-awareness. That's the only way it'll ever happen. In preparation for our conversation today, um, I read a piece that you wrote in Medium speaking about our awareness or self-awareness, self-knowledge. There are all kinds of biases at play. And in this particular piece that I was reading, you talked about six biases that were holding you back. Confirmation, conviction bias, appearance bias, the group bias, blame bias, and superiority bias. Do you have a point of view on which of these are the most popular or the which, which to be the most aware of for listeners because we, we can't cover all of them in our in our conversation here but what's the most popular and what should people um be most by far in? number one is the first one that begins the list which is confirmation bias right um, and it's the source of so many problems in the world so many bad attitudes so many irrational beliefs and basically what comes down to is you start off with certain beliefs and ideas that are ingrained in you. You don't even really know where they come from. They're usually based on emotions, right? And when you're looking out on the world for perhaps to judge things, you want confirmation of those ideas. You don't want disconfirmation or whatever the word would be, right? You want to see them confirmed. So you go searching for it. You only listen to these channels or these podcasts where you know they're going to affirm it. You only go to these Facebook posts that tell you that vaccines are dangerous because that confirms what you already believe. You have this bias. You want to hear that echo chamber that reflects how wonderful you are. It's our own narcissism. I'm telling you, you're more of a narcissist than you believe. And part of your narcissism is you have to associate with people who make you look great and look better because your ideas are so right. Okay, so that's how you're starting. That's how you're looking at everything in the world. You're looking at everything to confirm what you already believe. And then if something comes up that disconfirms it, you go through these mental gymnastics where you actually find a way 
of reversing the disconfirming evidence and finding it a way to fit into what you already believe, right? So the ability to say, my idea, the evidence, the science, whatever it is, shows that my idea was wrong. You know, I was wrong. I was looking at the world in the wrong, through the long, wrong lens. I had a bad idea. How many times have you ever heard that from people? How many times has somebody said, you know, I believed this two years ago, and then I realized what a fool I was, and I've, gotten, I've changed myself. Yeah, it happens, but man, is it rare, right? It is so rare. so rare. And so this is who we are. We want to believe what we already believe, and it's what motivates a lot of human behavior. It motivates our choices in life. We want to buy things that reflect what we already think about ourselves. We want to vote for particular politicians who already confirm what we think the world is about. We want to read books, on and on and on. And we narrow our information. We narrow what we think about. We narrow the world that we consider. And it creates a lot of irrational, stupid beliefs. Now, as I say, I'm guilty of that. When I research a book, I research human nature, I admit that I begin with a slightly negative viewpoint of human nature. It's, I can't help it. It's what I think. I'm, maybe I'm, I have a slight pessimistic streak. And as I'm researching, I'm going, Robert, this is bad. You know, it's, it's infecting the book and you want the book to be realistic. So I forced myself to read books that had the opposite approach. I didn't like them. They kind of rubbed me the wrong way. But then I said, maybe they're right. Maybe there's something in there that's true. Maybe we're not so bad. Maybe our ability to cooperate, our language skills, maybe we're not as bad as I'm point painting people out in the laws of human nature. It was very important for me to do it. I probably didn't do it enough, I admit it, but I was aware of the fact that I had biases that were actually infecting what I was writing about. So that's the most important bias of all. The second most important bias is the conviction bias. I'm just going in order. I won't go through all six because we'll take up 20 hours. But the conviction <laughs> bias is so irritating. It's so irritating because it's what you see on in, in media a lot. People who show that they really believe something so strongly, they're so emotional about it. They get up, they stomp the, the podium, they, you know, they pound the ground, etc., with their foot. They, it, they radiate conviction. And yet their beliefs, their ideas could be the stupidest ever in the history of mankind. But because they say it with so much conviction, we tend to believe that they must be telling the truth. Why would they be faking it? Why would they be putting on this show? It must be real. It must be something that they actually believe, right? And you need to take the opposite approach. When people are so emotional in expressing their ideas, your bullshit radar must be going, nip, 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 going up, right? Like that's how I can't lift my hand, left hand too long. It's just do one that goes going up, 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 right? There's bullshit here. Yes. They're disguising something. They're trying to con you by the level of conviction that they have. And the more c conviction they have, the more falsehood and, and bullshit is probably going on. So that's the second most, you know, common bias of all. In this piece that I was researching, that was the number one most highlighted phrase is in the conviction bias. It's about holding on to an idea that's secretly pleasing to us, but deep inside, we may have some doubts. And so we go the extra mile to convince ourselves otherwise, to believe with great vehemence and to loudly contradict anyone who challenges us. Guilty as fuck. <laughs> right there. Like, we all are. We all oh. are. God, that's, that's the part thing. of what you, I <laughs> The thing is, you think somebody is lying, but most often it's not that they're lying, it's that they're first lying to themselves. They actually believe the bullshit that they're peddling. They manage to convince themselves that war is peace, that right, wrong is right, or whatever you want, whatever Orwellian phrase you want. And now that they believe it and they've convinced themselves, then they can go in front of an audience and they can be full of that conviction that people like lap up like dogs. So yeah, it starts with them lying to themselves and then they can go out and lie to the world. Well, I uh, part of the what's I think interesting is there's this tension in your work. Like I know you as a 
spirited, brilliant thinker, wise, care about humans enough to write about the stuff that other people aren't writing about. So again, reconcile this with the work that I was, you know, quoting earlier, if I can um, go back to that, where this, you know, the, the juxtaposition of being ruthless and pragmatic. But again, I know you as, as, a, as a human who's just trying to make the world more awesome. Is that a, is that, do you see that as a burden? Is it tiring? I'm thinking about the process of you thinking about what to write next. And again, going back to this daily habit, which I think is a great format for your work. How do you, how do you speak to those two things coexisting? Which two things? I'm sorry. This, no, the, the, the fact that you're, um, again, I know you as someone who writes about these things because you care deeply and yet the things that you're writing about are sort of revealing what might be seen as an unpleasant side, whether it's through human nature or power or seduction or these things that, you know, uh, are, you know, core to being a normal flawed human being. So do I, do I have it wrong? Or again, my experience is that you, you write about these things because you care because other people aren't writing about them. Almost there's like an obligation that I sense from you. Is, am I reading that correctly? Yeah, you are. You are. You're very much reading it correctly. So I'm, 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 I'm 38 years old or whatever age, and it's time to write my first book. And I actually pitched it to this man. Every, a lot of people know the story. And, um, you know, I say I want to write this book about power, et cetera. And, and I have this idea about history and people, and, and the guy likes the idea. And then I go out and I do research, and I find zero, zero books from the, that have the approach that I think is right. Everything is all sugary and sentimental. We all were such wonderful beings. You know, we're, we just have to cooperate and get along with people. Manipulative people never get very far in life, whereas we all know the truth that manipulative people get very far in life. Etc. There are no books out there. No one's writing about it. All right, I'm going to write about it because I want to read that book. Then I decide to write my second book on seduction, right? And I'm thinking, oh, seduction? There must be a million books written about seduction. You know, it's such an exciting word. I couldn't find any books written on the subject with any kind of intelligence. It's all about, you know, go to a bar, wear this kind of shirt. If you're a woman, wear this kind of dress, you know, do say these kind of lines. It was just not, it was just such banal bullshit. Whereas seduction is a mythic concept. It's not banal. It's not like going into a bar and repeating certain lines. Seduction is what is the, the world, you know, makes the world go round. It's what, you know, it's in marketing, it's in publicity, it's in politics. No books out there about, sorry, no books out there about the subject. How irritating is that? No one's got the, the you know, the, the balls to write about what's really going on in seduction. All right, I'm going to have to write it. Uh, it comes time to write a book about war and strategy, my next book. You know, everybody loves like the art of war. Everybody in business is talking about warfare, et cetera. But there's no book out there that I could find that bridged that gap between warfare and daily life. What does Napoleon Bonaparte at Austerlitz have to do with my life in a job in an office. Nobody ever conquered that. Nobody ever took that on, right? It's either just, you know, describing Napoleon's great, you know, there's no practical effect. So I wanted to write that book that made Napoleon something that you could relate to in your day-to-day -day life. I mean, I'm going on, I'm going through all of my books. It's going to get boring. The, that's no, but this, you, you, no, you've made the point. And that's, again, there's this sort of, sense that I have in knowing you and knowing pretty intimately your work and that you care deeply is, and are willing to write the things, you know, I, I have a phrase, you can't stand out and fit in at the same time, right? That's one of the reasons your work stands out is because of this ruthless pragmatism, this, you know, and I think it's just, it's a dose of reality that, that we need. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not trying to blow smoke, but I just feel like that's, these are realizations that I'm voicing sort of in, in real time about your work. Yeah. I mean, um, 
You know, when it came time for the first book, because the first book basically turned my life around. If I hadn't done the 48 Laws of Power, I'd still be living in my one bedroom in San farm in Santa Monica, scraping by with crap jobs in Hollywood, maybe would have committed suicide by now. I don't know. The 48 Laws of Power changed me, right? And when we had that book in, the, my partner and I, because I had a packager and producer on a very wonderful man, um, the publisher goes, you know, this book is good. We like it. We think it'll do well, but we want you to soften it a little bit. It's a little too hard. The format is too weird. There's too many things going on on the page. You know, let's make it more like a normal book, right? And he backed me up, fortunately, and we said, no. We basically said the equivalent of F you will go to another publisher. You either accept what I've done or forget about it. Because this is an important lesson for all you listeners out, the world, out there. The world wants to make you more common than you actually are. The world wants to make you normal. They want to create pressures where they're going to make you conform to the standards, to the, to the kind of mediocre level that a lot of work is at. And your genius is in being original, is in being unique, is mining what makes you different. It doesn't have to be so different that nobody can understand you. That's not going to sell a book. That's not going to start a business. But it has to reflect what makes you different. And all these forces are going to come at you. Your parents, your bosses, your financiers, they're going to say, yeah, you got to soft, you got to bring it down a little bit. That's a little too weird. That's not what people are doing right now. That's not the movie that's selling $60 million right now. You got to do this and they're going to ruin you, right? You have to be able to stick to your original vision and have the, the idea that the only real path to power is through doing something that kind of reflects what makes you different and weird to a degree. You can go too far in that. And so that's sort of what happened with the 48 Laws. And if we hadn't stuck to our guns, you know, the book would have been watered down. Rappers wouldn't have been reading it. Other people wouldn't have never taken off. And I wouldn't be here talking to Chase Jarvis right now. <laughs> Speaking of rappers, the 50th law, just because you mentioned it, um, tell a story about the 50th law that, you know, when I first got wind of that book, it was, it was like Robert Greene and 50 Cent. Like it was just, it was like, uh, I don't know, it was beautiful. What's the, can you share with uh, anyone who it's, might not it's be kind familiar of like with the- it? It's kind of like the ruthless pragmatism type thing. It's kind of like yeah. Yeah. bananas and peanut butter, two things that don't shouldn't go together, but actually do go together very nicely. <laughs> um, well, you know, my the 48 Laws of Power was huge with rappers, you know, because they liked the fact that it was so sort of honest, brutally honest. And a lot of rappers were trying to get ahead in the music industry and the music industry makes Hollywood look like kindergarten. I mean, the music industry is the most hellish Machiavellian environment in the world. So this is a book that's telling you, here's what your record producers are probably, how they're screwing you right now. And they loved it. And 50 loved it because he was, at the time that his career broke out, around the year 2000, 2001, he was dealing with the worst kind of record producers. They were basically just, they canceled his first album because of, there was too much shit going on around him. And so he loved the 48 Laws of Power. So he contacted me, you know, just to meet me. And, you know, I, I'm, as you can tell, I'm this little kind of thin white guy who has no street cred or anything, you know, um, comes from total middle class background in Los Angeles. So I'm a little bit intimidated meeting him for the first time, you know, because I know that the reputation. But secretly, I did not know that he was going through the same thing. He was going, this this master strategist, this Henry Kissinger of power is coming to meet me. I'm a little bit intimidated. I'm nervous. So we were both kind of nervous, but we weren't admitting it to ourselves. And then I go, I meet him in the back room of a steakhouse. It's kind of like a scene out of Godfather, you know. (laughs) Back room, he's got all his posse there, and I'm by myself. I'm expecting the worst. And I sit down next to him, and the first thing I look at is, man, that is an insane bracelet you're wearing. That bling is unbelievable. I've never seen so many diamonds in one place. And I kind of calmed down. He was very relaxed. He was very normal. He kind of calmed down because he realized I'm not. he's not Henry Kissinger. And we had a really nice conversation. And it kind of epitomizes what I'm telling you, talking to you about. 
I love these sort of synthesis of opposites, right? Because everything in our culture is so is so um, generic, you know. A, a white guy from Los Angeles, middle class, is not supposed to write a book with this this black guy from from the hood, from Southside Queens, who you know was dealing crack, cocaine, etc. That just doesn't happen. Those two worlds are not meant to mix. You know, we can have all we can talk about how you know white guys love rap music, etc. But the world's actually mixing where you're being creative together. It doesn't happen too much. Yeah, sure, 50 will do something with Eminem, but Eminem is more like him. But me and 50, we were like, you know, as, as different as could be. And so bringing the two worlds together was really exciting for me because it makes a point that I have is that we're all human. 50 and I connected on a higher level that transcended Middle class Los Angeles and Southside Queens. It was a level of strategy. It was a level of being practical. It's a way of looking at the world through that lens of what are the games people are playing. You know, he, we talked in that first meeting about some of the um, beefs he was going through at the time and the strategy he was going through. And I was going, God, this guy's a really good strategist. He's kind of thinking like a Napoleon here, how he's going to ruin this particular rapper, how he's going to destroy Ja Rule for these particular strategies. I got very impressed. So on that higher level, that more human level of ideas and ways of thinking, we connected like two human beings and we created great music. I love working with him. And in fact, I'm working with him right now. We're trying to do a television version of the 50th Law. So um, that's in wow. the process, you know. Wow. Yeah. Well, that whole process you described, again, my background is in philosophy and there's a philosopher called Hegel. I didn't know that. Oh, sure. Yeah, the, the dialectic, right? The yeah, yeah. thesis, the antithesis, and somewhere right. in there is a synthesis right. of, of ideas or our mutual friend, Tim Ferriss, right? Who is like, if this is the thing, what would happen if I did the opposite? These are very right. constructive frameworks continuously that, you know, go back to what we've been sort of harping on a little bit is this is not a common way of approaching a problem or an opportunity uh, in, in the world. So I need, I need to understand one more thing about the framework for your new book, the daily laws. Um, and I'll just say this, the subhead again is 366 meditations on power, seduction, mastery, strategy, and human nature. And it's an aggregate of a bunch of different books put together in a very, very thoughtful way. Is there, um, do you encourage reading beyond the individual day? Because I do not do very good <laughs> with just reading my one page and 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 going to sleep so i'm curious when you put this thing together um i love the idea of a daily anything you, you referenced ryan the daily stoic i did a, a show for years called the daily creative on youtube i love the format i love the format what is it okay if i read ahead is it cheating or have you just crafted this and this is for the person who's buying the book right now i'm trying to give them a sense of how to consume it as the way the the creator intended no the creator intended it for you to do whatever the hell you want to do with it you know you can use it as a doorstop if you want you can <laughs> read it from the end to the beginning i've done that with some books there's this writer that i like a lot who writes this book that's really kind of scrambled structure i decided i was going to read the book backwards and I loved it. It was a really great way to read a book. Read the book backwards. Start from December 31st. Read randomly. Do one of those random number generators on the internet. Put the word 366 in it, and it'll come up with 42. All right, I'll do 42 today. Whatever you want. I don't care. Just read the book and let it get in, you know get inside you. And you can read as many different, you know, the title. Each day has a title. You can look at the title. And you can decide, I believe there's a table of contents, excuse me here. Yeah. Oh, hold sorry, no, there isn't. No, it's okay. Do hold it up for just for us. We to originally see had a second. table of contents, I guess it got axed. Um, <laughs> you can thumb through it and see the titles and go, that's something that's going on right now in my life. I'm going to read that. Nobody's going to punish you for doing it. But the book was designed with a particular structure 
and a particular logic to it that, you know, it might be helpful to follow at least at some point. But I, I love be- starting off with this attitude. I, you know, that's what I felt in early in, in, in the book. That's a, you know, and you talked about the different chapters that are associated with uh, each month, but um, that's why I kind of, I was rec- trying to reconcile it. I, I'm not very good at that, but I at, know you laid what? it out with such intention at just reading today's meditation. I'm like, oh, you know, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm reading ahead. I'm consuming. Um, well, that's fine. I, you know, I, whatever is good. It's just that you're not going to be, you're going to, you're going to kind of mess the juju of the book. You're going to like have read the first 40 pages and now where do you go, you know, et cetera. But I don't care, Chase. It's, it's all Fair good. Enough. Fair uh, the enough. other thing is each month begins with a kind of an essay. So there's original material in the book. Um, and it's also things from interviews and podcasts and such. But each month begins with an essay that's sort of about my own personal experience and how what I've been through in life with my own jobs, with writing these books, with my consulting work, how they inform um, the the material in all six of my books and in this book, which is something I've never done before because I've always been a bit shy about ever talking about myself. So that's one element that I think is, is new in this book. Certainly new. I've been trying to get you to talk about yourself in each of the last three interviews like crazy. <laughs> you just keep bringing it back to the work. Um, to that end, I wanted to ask you a, a personal question uh, in, in service of that. And, you know, there's plenty in this book on creativity. And I know you know me for that. That's what I've written uh, on. I shared an early draft of my book with you. Yes, Thank you for giving, wonderful for giving me for giving giving me the feedback that you did i think um it certainly helped make it into the book it was uh, it is um but i want your personal view on creativity as you know as 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 a key foundational vector in our lives i just wanted to hear it from you rather than from your perfectly crafted books <laughs> Well, the thing is, it's it's a word that we use a lot, but is is kind of mythologized a bit, and people have all sorts of illusions surrounded around the word that isn't the reality. So the reality is, is that creativity is a function of the previous work that you've put into into a project, right? So if you put put a lot of hours into into thinking about your book, into researching, reading. Doing reading a lot of other books and planning and structuring it and going over again hour after hour, a very tedious process. Or you go through a rigorous apprenticeship in your field for many years. A moment will come where creativity will just simply come to you. You can't force it. The best things in life are the things that come to you because you can't force something like creativity. You can't wake up, and I've had this feeling, and I'm sure you've had where you need to be creative and it won't happen. It's just, it's like the word inspiration is very true. It almost comes to you, but that comes to you after the hours, the tedious hours of work and process. And that's not just the process that goes into your one book or your one business. It goes into the process of your whole life, of your elementary school, of your high school, of your previous habits, of your previous experiences. You're a whole person. It comes out into in through this process, right? And so creativity is not this kind of magic, this this kind of silly little idea that we have where some people have it and some people don't. It's actually something very real, and it occurs for a very good reason. And neuroscientists who study the brain and who've studied highly creative people in chess, in music, in sports, you can be very creative in sports as well, um, have shown that certain things happen in the brain. Certain patterns occur where you reach a level where you have so much knowledge about something that ideas come to you out of nowhere. You're taking a shower and suddenly it comes to you what you need to do. You're, you're, you're taking a walk outside, you don't expect it, and suddenly that brilliant idea comes to you. And I have to tell the audience, you know, I haven't, 
I'm not on a creative on the level of, 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 of a great artist or anything like that, but I have had moments of creativity and they're the most wonderful moments of all. They're feelings of tremendous power. They're trem- feelings almost, almost godlike, if I can use that word. And I know it sounds blasphemous, but it's almost godlike or wow. My brain is like, I don't have to think things are coming to me and they're great ideas. And I don't even know why they're coming to me. It's such a wonderful, fluid, open feeling that I'm telling you it's worth the years of apprenticeship. It's worth the years, the blood, sweat, and tears of research, of hard work. Because when you reach that level, when that happens, when that magic happens, it's a wonderful feeling. And you're not going to be able to go through all that tedious work unless you know that at the end there's this incredible reward. And so I want to tell you, and that's what the point of mastery is, it will come to you. I don't care what, I don't care your education. I mean, in in mastery, I interviewed a woman, um, Temple Grandin, who was born with high level autism, and she is incredibly creative. In, in her science, because she's a scientist. I don't care what your level of education or all of your problems in life or whatever. If you have the intense dedication over a five, 10 year period, creative ideas will come to you, I guarantee it. And you, it'll be a wonderful, it will transform you. It will be what Abraham Maslow called the peak experience. Once you have a peak experience, your life forever changes because you're constantly in search of having them over, over and over again. And you'll want to have that creative feeling again and again, and it will literally transform you. Well, I can't think of a better way to get that transformative experience than to, as you said, apply yourself with rigor. Uh, and the your 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 book, The Day of the Laws, is a great is a great inspirator for that. Uh, congratulations on the book! Another extraordinary work of staggering genius. Uh, What's next? Where you know, obviously, get the book. Uh, I know you're doing an event with Ryan. We've talked about Ryan; he's a dear friend, a mutual friend, and and you've got an event coming up. Uh, I believe when is October it? October 11th. Uh, yeah, it's October 11th. So we're going to drop this the week that before that. So if you happen to check this out, there's an if you Google uh, Robert Green, Ryan Holiday, and Eventbrite, there's a, a link there for you to get some um, to be able to tap into that. Uh, is there anywhere else? I mean, you're so prolific. Again, millions of books sold. Is there somewhere you'd rather steer somebody other than, uh, you know, to their local bookshop or to uh, to Amazon? I have, a, or, I have a new website, but damn if I can remember what the address is. I think it's robertgreen.com. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I should know that. Uh, we'll you should. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind, I'm of, kind of like my worst publicist sometimes. So I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll get that to you and you can create a little cry on or something. If you like. but, um, yeah, there'll be I, um, I, all the interviews and, and media that I've been doing. You know, I'm going to be on some TV, television shows and other great podcasts like Chase Jarvis, et cetera. Um, so that'll be the aggregator. If I knew actually knew the address to share with you, I, <laughs> I apologize. So f- it's so fitting for the guy who writes on power and strategy. Um, Robert, thank you so much for being uh, a guest on the show yet again. Your insight, the the way that you challenge us, is so appreciated in in our world. Uh, thanks. Keep doing you. Um, grateful to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Chase. Always, always the most fun interviews of all have come from you. So, and it's the first awesome. one. So thank you so That's much. That's right. We're right. kicking off. I can't wait. I just, it felt uh, very raw and real to get you before you'd been yep. on any of the big TV shows and, and other big podcasts. <laughs> so, thanks again for being on the show. And to everybody out there in the world, please check out Robert's latest work. And uh, if you have enjoyed this, there's a couple other conversations we've had that are well worth your time. And until next time, speaking of, I bid you all out there in the internet and the real world, I bid you adieu.